Hello, everyone. Hi, thanks for coming. If you haven't made your way over, please join us over on the main stage area. Um, we're going to be starting, we're starting the Caring for Your Collection panel talk. So my name is Belinda Harrow, and I would like to welcome you to the eighth edition of Art Now and today's panel, Caring for Your Collection. Art Now is presented by SAS Galleries, who are so pleased to host an in-person art fair here in Regina. SAS Galleries is the not-for-profit organization dedicated to promoting, developing, and encouraging the growth of Saskatchewan professional art galleries who exhibit and sell original works of art. SAS Galleries is grateful to its funder, Creative Saskatchewan, and we'd also like to thank the Insurance Institute of Saskatchewan for sponsoring this panel. So we're here on Treaty 4 land today. However, this art fair welcomes artists, galleries, and visitors from across Saskatchewan, including Treaties 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10, uh, which includes the Nahewak, the Nashanabe, the Dakota, Lakota, Nakota peoples, the Dene Nation, and the Métis uh, Nation. So for this afternoon's panel, um, we have some experts today um, who are going to talk to us about things that will help you um, consider what it takes to care for the art that you have in your home. So I have with me uh, Dennis Cookson, who's here in the middle, um, who's with the Insurance Institute of Saskatchewan. Yolan Kruger, who's here from Yolan Kruger Art Services, and Robin Canham, who's the conservator at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum. And all three are going to provide expert information and advice on insurance, appraisal, conservation, and preventative care when it comes to looking after the art in your home. So um, I'm going to do a little introduction of each of the people that we have with us today. So Robin Canham, who is on the end, is a graduate of Queen's University with a Master's of Art Conservation program and specializes in the conservation of paper and books. Prior to joining the Royal Saskatchewan Museum, Robin previously worked in conservation labs at Queen's University Archives, Provincial Archives of Alberta, and held a position of Cress Conservation Fellow at Queen's University Library, the W.D. Jordan Rare Books and Special Collections. Most recently, Robin was awarded the 2023 Emerging Conservator of the Year Award by the Canadian Association for Conservation of Cultural Property. So congratulations, Robin. That's a great award. And Robin is from Saskatchewan, but has been away, and we're so excited to have her back and working in the province because there's a real shortage of conservation experts in our province, so we're really happy to have her here. Dennis Cookston is the manager of the Ins Insurance Institute of Saskatchewan. The Institute sets professional standards for the industry through education programs that lead to a range of uh, designations and certificates, including the internationally recognized Chartered Insurance Professional, the CIP, and fellow Chartered Insurance Professional. Uh, Yolan Kruger was born and raised in Regina, Saskatchewan. She attended the Alberta University of the Arts and graduated in 2008 with a Bachelor of Fine Arts with distinction in glass. In 2021, she completed her course work with the International Society of Appraisers and is currently working as a fine art and studio craft appraiser in Lumsden, Saskatchewan. So we also have a shortage of appraisers in this province, so we're so pleased to have Yolan coming back to Saskatchewan from Alberta to apply her knowledge in appraisals. So welcome to our panelists, and um, I just wanted to say Yesterday we had a panel talk on collecting art. I think most of the people who are here today have a real passion for art. They have a number of artworks in their home. And 
when you think about owning an object, there is a certain amount of responsibility and knowing how to care for that object. We're really all just temporary caregivers for these objects, and we want them to stay in good condition as best we can, and so these experts today are going to help you get some tips on how to do that so that you can then pass on these treasured objects to other family members, perhaps, uh, for the future. So um, I'm going to start by having everyone do a little uh, introduction to their area of expertise, and then we're going to talk a little bit more with questions. So Yolan, you're going to start for us. Hello friends and thank you so much Belinda for the introduction. My name is Yolan Kruger and I'm a member of the International Society of Appraisers. I work independently from my home in Lumsden, Saskatchewan and am not affiliated with any galleries or art dealers. However, I do value their great source of knowledge and enjoy working in collaboration with the many great gallerists you have seen here at Art Now. I'm here today with my fellow panelists to help shed some light on topics that many people might have questions about or aren't even aware are available. I am an appraiser who specializes in fine art and studio craft. Today, during my presentation, I will be showing images of objects from my own personal collection or works by my former instructors. To begin, we must have an understanding of what an appraisal is and why people might want to have or need one done. An appraisal is defined simply as an opinion of value or cost. According to the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, an appraisal can be expressed as a specific amount, a range of numbers, or a relationship to a previous value opinion or set amount. In understanding that an appraisal is an opinion of value, there are many reasons why a person might have one done. However, the most common reasons regarding art appraisals are insurance, donation, determination of value for resale or purchase, and fair distribution of assets. In order to know what kind of appraisal is needed, the appraiser must consult with their client to understand the intended use of the appraisal. In art appraising, the two most common values are fair market value and replacement value. Each are used in their own reasons and understanding the needs of the client will help the appraiser determine the appropriate value. Fair market value is the highest price expressed in terms of money that the property would bring in an open and unrestricted market between a willing buyer and a willing seller who are knowledgeable, informed, and prudent, and who are acting independently of each other. This is the definition provided by the Canadian Revenue Agency. Fair market value is often used when referring to objects being sold and purchased on the secondary market. Replacement value is the amount it would cost to replace an item with one similar, like quality, purchased in the most appropriate marketplace within a reasonable amount of time. Replacement value includes not only the cost um, of acquiring or replicating the property, but also all the relevant costs associated with replacement. You can see here the replacement value covers everything that has gone into the object, from the print itself at $250 to shipping and duty at $42 and framing at $451. This makes the replacement value just over $743 compared to the fair market value, which would be $250 for the print. Depending on what the appraisal will be used for will depend on what kind of value needs to be determined. As you can see here, an appraisal for insurance purposes would need a replacement value determined, which is different than an appraisal for a charitable donation, which would need a fair market value determined. 
When having an appraisal done, there are a few key components that should always be part of the appraisal. The effective date is necessary, as the market is always changing, and it is important to know when the appraisal was done. The purpose of the appraisal and who it is for will help determine what value is needed and who the intended user is. Information regarding the object is extremely important, as the object itself could be lost, stolen, or damaged, and the only thing you have left is the appraisal. Comparisons and reason justification for value are important to help illustrate the evidence used to determine the valuation. And finally, a USPAP statement if the appraiser is USPAP compliant. When visiting clients' collections, I'm often shown appraisals that have, they have had done in the past. Now, the examples I'm showing here are just taken from the internet, but many I see look roughly the same. They consist of a one page that lists some, but not all, of the key information. Here you can see the information about the object is provided and an image of the work, along with a retail value, which would translate to a replacement value. However, the rest of the key information, like the effective date, comparisons, and reason justification, are missing. Here is another example of a one-page appraisal, where more key information is provided than the one on the previous slide. Now, I'm not saying that these appraisals are bad, and they might be all you need for your purpose. But let me show you what a USPAP compliant appraisal should look like. A USPAP compliant appraisal should be multiple pages which explain all the key elements involved to determine the appropriate value. There should always be a page within the body of the report which shows the object being appraised and lists all the information known about the object. This can include provenance. Was this painting exhibited in any shows? Was it part of an important collection? Was this painting purchased directly from the artist? Or maybe it was a commission? In this case, the painting was acquired through an estate. The next thing you should see are the comparisons used to determine the value. It's important to know that determination of value is not based on a guess, rather determined through research and evidence. Here you can see two recent comparisons for Dorothy Martin that have sold on the secondary market through auction. Once the comparisons have been illustrated, the appraiser would write up a reason justification to explain their determination of value. In this particular case, comparison two is roughly the same size as the painting being appraised, whereas comparison one is much smaller. It is this kind of research and evidence that appraisers would write about in their reason justification. Then, the USPAP certification would be included which would list any kind of conflict, bias, limiting condition, and more that could impact the appraisal. And finally, a short write-up about the appraiser should always be included to show that the person doing the appraisal is qualified. Next slide. So, now that we know what an appraisal is, what it should look like, and why someone might get one done, it is important to understand that in some circumstances, it is important to have an object reappraised. Looking back at the slide I used to talk about replacement value, we can see that the replacement value listed here is from 2011, when the print was originally purchased. Next slide. Now, it is possible that the value from 2011 has not changed or has maybe gone down. However, when looking at Yoshi by Mark Ryden, we can see that the value of the print has increased. Next slide. In closing, I would like to make a quick note of what an appraisal is not. An appraisal is not an authentication, a conservation report, a proof of ownership, and the appraisal itself cannot be used or transferred outside of what its original intended use was. Next slide. I hope this pre brief introduction to what an appraisal is was informative. And once again, here is my contact information if you are ever in need of an appraisal. Or you can always look up the International Society of Appraisers and use their Find an Appraisal search 
to find a specialist for whatever kind of object you need help with. Thank you. That was fantastic. Wow, I learned something and I thought I knew what appraisals were, so <laughs> that's fantastic. Thanks, Yolan. Okay, we're gonna just pause there and then I'm gonna ask Dennis if he would like to tell us a little bit about insurance. I'm sure um, there's a lot of different contexts when it comes to insurance and he's our expert, so he's going to give us a little bit of information. I think that's going to be useful. I'm going to find it useful because I have a collection myself at home. So thanks, Dennis. Thank you for having me. And, and I know how much people love talking about insurance too, so I, I will, try, will try not to put anybody to sleep, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, so let me just kind of start off by saying that uh, I am not an insurance broker. I do not sell insurance. Um, I am on the education side, so I'm not here to try and sell you guys insurance or sell you guys coverage. I just want to talk to you guys about the importance of having the correct insurance coverage. Um, when you're looking at your property policy, home, tenant, condo, whatever the case might be, there are a lot of similarities between insurance companies out there, the SGIs, the Wawanisas, Sandbox, Intact, Aviva, etc. Um, but one thing you really should be doing on your policy is looking at the coverage that is available, as well as looking at any exclusions and in some cases exceptions to those exclusions. So you might have a circumstance where this type of loss is not covered, except when this occurs. Things like um, for artwork, you're looking at things like chipping, breakage, things like that may not be covered typically, but if the damage is caused by fire, by theft, by attempted theft, things like that, then the damage would be covered. And the one thing I will always stress when it comes to your insurance coverage, whether you're talking about fine arts, whether you're talking about your home, your auto, your business, whatever the case might be, if you have questions about your policy, don't be afraid to go talk to your broker about it. Don't be afraid to go into their office, sit them down and go, what does this mean? Their job, that is their job. That's what they get paid to do. They're there to get you a policy that best fits your needs. You know those needs best, but they are certainly there to help as part of that process. So again, don't be afraid to go talk to your broker. And, and if you don't feel like you're getting the service you need from your broker, if they don't want to answer those types of questions, don't be afraid to move your business either. You know, like these guys are, are relying on commission, but they have a service that they're supposed to be providing too. One of the main things that, that we see with insurance or one of the difficulties we see with insurance sometimes is when you're looking at things like fine arts, um, jewelry, things, things of that nature, typically insurance policies, home, tenant, condo, again, will have what they refer to as special limits. So there's typically two numbers to kind of be worry, worried about with this. One is an overall limit. So you'll have X number of dollars available on your policy to cover all of your items. And it's typically a pretty small number. Um, for jewelry, for, as an example, it's typically about $5,000. So it's not gonna go very far. The other number that you wanna be looking at is a per item limit. So typically what you'll see on a policy is you will see, okay, you have coverage up to $5,000 and the limit for any one item is 500. So if you have that one piece that is worth $1,500, $2,500, that's fine. You're still under the policy limit, but that per item limit is gonna, be, is gonna come up in a claim. So if you have something like that, you would wanna look at buying separate coverage for that. Typically, insurance companies will call it a rider or it's scheduled coverage, whatever, whatever kind of terminology you wanna use. Uh, there is an extra premium for that, obviously, but that's where the appraisal comes in as well, where we're looking for that replacement value. So if there is a fire, if there's water damage, if it's stolen, what is it actually gonna cost to replace that item? So you're looking at the cost of reproduction, the framing, like what Yolanda had on her slides, um, anything like that that, that is kind of, of a, ugh, easy for me to say, kind of associated with that. Um, sentimental value, we're trying to kind of leave that off to the side, that can sometimes be an issue. You do see it, you know, I, we were kind of talking about this earlier, you see it through the appraisal process, you certainly see it from the insurance process, where 
somebody believes that they have a piece of artwork that is worth thousands and thousands of dollars. It's the sentimental value that they're really looking at. They, this was my grandmother's. It just reminds me of home, that kind of thing. But when you do the appraisal, it, it maybe isn't worth as much as you thought. So you kind of have to keep that in mind as well. Um, insurance companies in Saskatchewan, typically they have a little bit of a, I'll call it an upper limit as far as they want to cover, where if the value of the artwork is too high, they maybe aren't that willing to provide coverage. So in a case like that, your broker might be looking at more of a specialty market like a Lloyd's of London. That, that's the kind of company that kind of specializes in those. Um, but again, your broker could certainly walk you through all those different circumstances and where you should be going for coverage and that kind of thing. When you're looking at artwork, there, there's typically kind of two big exclusions that you see. Um, one is for property that's on display. So in a show like this where you don't typically have it on display all the time. You're, you're kind of doing it for a weekend or for one show. Um, coverage for, for that artwork while it's at the show is typically excluded. You'd have to buy separate coverage for that. And then if you've got items that are, are fragile, are brittle, you, you typically don't see a lot of coverage for, for that. Like if it's, if it's damaged because it's brittle, because it's fragile, unless the damage is caused by something like fire, like theft, attempted theft, water, things like that. Um, and then the last clause that, that sometimes comes up when you're looking at uh, fine arts, things like that, is what we call the pair and set clause. So if I have two pieces that are together as part of a collection and one is damaged, they are not going to replace the entire collection. They're going to replace that one piece that, is, that has been damaged or has been lost. So um, with your insurance, you're not, you're not, it's set up that you're not supposed to profit from it. So if you only lose part of the collection, they only replace part of the collection. Um, so we do see that sometimes as well, where you know I've lost half the collection, I want the whole thing replaced, otherwise it doesn't look right or it doesn't match or whatever the case might be. Uh, the insurance industry is not going to replace the full thing. They're just going to replace that section that has been lost. Um, but again, if you've got questions about your individual policy, don't be afraid to talk to your broker. That's, that's what they're there for. If, if you come away with nothing else from me rambling on here today, that's definitely the one point I want to kind of get across. But uh, thank you for having me here today. Thanks so much, Dennis. Yeah, I think there might be a lot of people's collection where they, the sentimental pieces, the family pieces, where they wouldn't necessarily need anything special. But if you were one of those lucky people who bought, you know, a Joe Fafard ceramic object in the 60s or the 70s, um, that would have a lot of value. You might seriously want to think about something special with an object like that, or a Vic Sikansky, or, or you know, a Dorothy Knowles painting, Greg Hardy painting, those ones that are in the higher amounts. And I'll just say before we move on to talk about conservation, um, all of this is good knowledge, but if you haven't taken the time to keep good record of what you have, um, files, do you have a file at home where you've put your maybe original purchase receipt in it? Um, if you've had appraisals done, you've kept that. Um, and nowadays it's quite good, you have a photograph of it. Uh, it's quite good to save these things in in the cloud because then if you did have a fire, um, you wouldn't lose the documentation that's really important to being able to make a claim. Um, especially if you have just a standard insurance policy like I do and I have a lot of art in my house um, and I sort of forget what I have sometimes because I have so much. So I think that's a good tip um, to think about when you have a collection and you've got a number of objects, it's kind of good, you know, estate planning too, um, to keep track of the things that you have. You can always make use of that later. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go. So thanks so much, Dennis. And, oh. I think, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, when, when you get into a claim situation, it's stressful enough that you know, trying to figure out, oh my goodness, what, do, what did I have in this room? What, what, what do I have to actually replace? Um, to go through your home and have a list of those items is certainly beneficial. Um, 
put a copy on file with your broker. If you've got a safe deposit box, put it in there. Um, we do see people certainly that are going around and actually taking videos of their room so that they can go around and say, they can hand that over to the adjuster and the adjuster can kind of look at it and go, okay, here's everything we have to look at. Um, because you see it a lot in our industry as well where somebody gets into a claim situation and they have no idea what they've got or they don't know what's going on or what's going to happen. So they, they, to have that documentation is certainly very beneficial. Great, thanks. Okay, so now we're going to have Robin tell us a little bit about art conservation. Yeah, thanks so much for having me here. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, so art conservation is a relatively uh, new profession. Uh, it began in 1966 after the Arno River flooded Florence. And during the flood, an estimated three to four million books and manuscripts uh, were damaged along with 14,000 um, artworks. So during the disaster, uh, the event brought together restorers and conservators from around the world, and they talked and uh, established the need for formalized education and training programs. And today in Canada, uh, conservators usually seek out post-secondary education, and they specialize in an area, so paintings, uh, paper, or artifacts. And I'm a paper conservator, and I work with paper and book objects. Um, so if you have a question at the end about paintings or anything other than, uh, uh, than paintings or, or artifacts, I'll probably be able to answer your paper questions, but uh, I may not be able to answer all of them. Uh, so just keep that in mind. <laughs> um, but uh, art conservation as a formal professional field has only been around for about 57 years. Next slide. So when I'm talking to people about art conservation and what I do, um, they don't always know what the role of a conservator entails and often um, relate what I do to restoration. However, uh, conservation and restoration are quite different. So conservation is an interdisciplinary approach that incorporates art, history, uh, science, and material science. And it's, uh, the goal of art conservation is to document, stabilize, and preserve. And conservators work under a code of ethics, and conservation treatments aim to not impede future scientific examination or adversely impact future treatments or functionality of the object or artwork. So generally, um, the major tenant in art conservation is that everything is non-invasive and as reversible as possible. Conservators also focus on preventative conservation, which I'll talk about a little bit later in today's presentation. And this stops damage and deterioration from happening before it becomes a problem. Uh, restoration, on the other hand, focuses its efforts upon returning the object or work to its original state or appearance. This can erase the physical historical markers of an object's use by significantly altering physical evidence and original materials. So one approach is not necessarily better than the other. For example, you may want to restore a, a vintage car so you can drive it around town and look cool. Uh, but you might want to conserve a book so that it retains its original leather binding. Yeah, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, no, keep going. Oh, back one. There you go. Um, so as I mentioned, um, conservators essentially focus on two different areas, on treatment and preventative conservation. So I thought I would focus on some uh, treatments first to demonstrate what is possible, um, what are some possible outcomes uh, with conservation. And um, these are examples of work that I've done. This first example is a 20th century silver gelatin photograph. And 
Uh, as you can see in the before photo, uh, there was a large, there were quite a few large tears, and this puts the photograph at uh, risk of further tearing, further damage, and we want to prevent that from happening. So the tear was fixed with Japanese tissue and wheat starch paste used as an adhesive, and that was applied to the back of the photograph. And then uh, gelatin was used to fill in any of the gaps on the front to create a really nice uh, flat finish uh, that didn't take away from the, um, the overall look and feel of the, the photograph. Next slide, please. Um, this one is a handwritten letter by Louis Riel, and it is ink on a blue paper. Uh, so this work was very fragile, um, especially along all of the folds where, where the uh, document had been folded. And uh, this object belongs to the Provincial Archives of Alberta. So it was really important that the uh, letter be available to researchers and the public in the reading room if they would like to uh, view it. So um, losses and tears were filled with Japanese tissue, and in this case, the tissue was toned uh, to match the color of the blue paper, and it was applied with a wheat starch paste adhesive. And um, as you can see in the after photo, um, the uh, document reads as a lot more as a whole, um, and it can now be safely handled in the reading room without any risk of further damage. Next slide, please. And uh, in this last example that I have today, uh, this is a detail of a chromolithograph that was highly stained. So conservators, of, uh, paper conservers especially, often employ stain reduction techniques. Um, this uh, chromolithograph, was a uh, there was a backing on it of several pieces, pieces of newsprint. And the newsprint had yellowed due to oxidization and created a really um, acidic backing on the print. So it was able to be removed from the backing and washed several times with some stain reduction techniques. And as you can see, after the acid, acid um, byproducts were removed, the print gained its original color and became quite vibrant. Uh, as well as the discrete staining was able to be reduced so that again, it reads as a lot more uh, original than um, the previous. Thank you. Great, thanks Robin. <laughs> so just a few follow-up questions. I imagine that this type of work is, it's very specialized time-consuming and requires special materials and knowledge. So, I mean, a lot of these um, techniques are probably out of the reach of an average person who has a collection who maybe needs some work done. Financially, I guess I'm asking. Or, or not. Um, okay. Yeah, a lot of the techniques used require um, specific solvents. We work... Um, you know, in um, depending on what solvent we're using, we need to use a fume hood. Um, we need to ensure uh, proper safety and storage of of the materials and equipment that we use. Um, sorry, but can oh, you okay. can you repeat the question? I guess I'm thinking um, in terms of like, in terms of. I think the the few the things that maybe are have an effect on the art objects or the paper or photography that, that we own are uh, light, right. damage, physical damage, like the tear you showed, folding, um, tape, things like adhesives, um, like ways of displaying, um, water, um, I would think, also has, a dam has damage. Yes. So um, it is, I know through my work, the the cost of conserving something is can be quite high. Right. Yeah, yeah usually um, the cost is the time because there's so much time involved in some of these treatments. Um, 
but also more and more the supplies. So conservators really love to use uh, wheat starch paste. Um, it's an adhesive that we make, uh, and it's, I think it's like tripled or quadrupled in cost lately. It's also very hard to obtain right now. Um, unfortunately, most of the wheat starch in the world is produced in the Ukraine, and uh, so it's making it very difficult to uh, source uh, that wheat starch currently. So, um, yes, materials are also difficult to find, but uh, we also use a lot of specialized equipment as well um, when we're working with, with um, objects, and they can also be financially um, you know, uh, expensive to to um, attain in the in the first place. So, yeah. So I think probably the best thing to consider is is preventative actions. So yes. we thought we would talk a little bit about some of the things that you can do um, to make sure help these sort of things from happening to your paintings and your drawings and your prints. Um, to start with. So, like mm -hmm. I said, I think the first thing to keep in mind is to keep be your own good registrar, keep good records of all of the things that you have in terms of your art. It's always good if in the future you're going to be passing information, uh, I mean, not information, artworks down to other family members. It's really nice to keep a record of what you have um, so that they know. And if there's any special stories, like, you know, make a note of where you purchased that work from or did you buy it directly from the artist? Is there a nice story behind why you have that object or did it come to you from someone else? I think those are all really good things. That's what we call the provenance of an artwork? Was it lent and put into an exhibition? Um, those are all things that I think, um, if you have a special object, as it travels down the family line, or it goes into a collection through a donation process, all of that information is really important. So um, now we, it's a lot easier to keep track of things with technology. It's easy to photograph things. You just keep it digital records of things. But um, that would be an advice I would have that I've come across in my professional job working with a collection when people come to us with objects. You know how many times people, that's why I wanted to put this panel together. So many times people have come to us and said, I don't know anything about this object. I don't know. I just, it, you know, I inherited it or it's been pass down the family line. So um, as much information as you can have is really good to keep. And then the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is some um, advice about um, things that can affect your work. So Yolande, you work quite often with helping people out with inventories. Uh, you come in and see the work. So what are some of the things that you've seen that have affected the value of the work maybe because of the environment that um, it's been uh, kept in? Yeah, I think environment, like you said, is really important to think about. Um, we have such a changing climate here from extreme colds to hot. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit humid. Sometimes it's dry, dry, dry. And when you have objects that are in a spot where those type of conditions aren't controlled, it can definitely affect the works. And I'm sure you can uh, speak to that as well, Robin, um, about, like you said, water, sunlight, all those type of things. Um, I'm a big believer in when you purchase a piece of art, you're probably purchasing it because it spoke to you and because you love it. And you want to live with that object. And sometimes living with an object, it's not going in the best place for that object. And that's just a decision you have to make on your own. But it, it can affect the work. Sunlight um, is a really big one. Um, but I am guilty of it myself, where I have works that are in very sunny locations because I want to see them every day and enjoy them. But the thing that you touched on that I see the most is documentation. 
Um, I can't explain enough how important documentation is. Um, also, I'm sure for insurance as well. Uh, but I often have people call me and say, you know, I inherited this and I, I know nothing about it. Can I get it appraised? Th that's a very hard thing to appraise when you know nothing. Um, and I also see where people have had great intentions. And um, I just recently had a client who her father passed away and he gave this great list, um, but he had revamped the list over years and crossed things out and he had taken stickers and put, in, put a number on the back of all the work. Well, over time the stickers fell off. So some had stickers, some didn't. The intention was great, but a photograph of the work with the documentation is priceless um, because it will let whoever becomes the next owner of the work um, know about it. And also, this might sound silly, but it will let you know about it. Uh, if you collect and you collect over the years, that piece that you bought 20 years ago, you might not even remember who made it. Again, guilty. Um, my first piece of ceramics that I bought, I bought in Ontario uh, at a craft fair, and I love it to this day. Unfortunately, I can't tell you who the artist is because I never wrote it down. So it's something to think about, um, is documentation. Um, and we've got uh, Michael Rankin in the audience. I see him there, who's a fantastic framer. I can't also stress enough the importance of getting things framed well. The purpose of the frame is to protect the work. So if it falls off the wall, you know, there's a chance that the frame will break, but the artwork will be um, preserved and have less damage. Um, and there's a lot of new technologies now. There's UV protection glass, UV protection plexiglass um, that helps filter the light so that if you have a south-facing window and you want that, you know, David Thauberger dance land print to be above your TV that gets a little bit of light on it, then you know it's going to be a little bit protected and you can have the artwork where you want to have it. So um, when you invest in an artwork, you also want to invest in some good quality framing. Yeah. I think you're touching on a very important thing there, is investing in good framing. But sometimes we don't know the right questions to ask. Like you just said, there's multiple different types of glass. There's different types of matting. Does, is it, you know, uh, does it have acid in it? Does it not? So sometimes when you're trying to you know, do the right thing, you might not know the right questions to ask. And so being able to ask people like Michael, uh, you know, what is the best thing to do to care for this work when I'm having it framed? How can it live out its best life and how can I care for it is really important. But like you're saying, it's, it's knowing the right questions to ask and knowing that a frame is not a frame. Like there are very different levels of framing. Um, and so knowing that uh, getting the right frame for the right artwork is, is something that can ha help it um, with a life long lived. So I'm going to um, pass over to Robin again, who's put together a little presentation about prevention conservation. So do you want to tell us some good tips, Robin? Yeah, so again, um, you know, you spend a lot of... Uh, spend a lot of money on your collection, and so you want to make sure that it's cared for. And um, a lot of these things in preventative conservation don't even actually cost extra money. You just have to be aware and uh, vigilant and wise like as to where in your house that you store things and um, that kind of thing. So just being mindful. Um, uh, next slide. Linda. OK, so these are all real life examples that I have personally seen. <laughs> um, and so this is an example of a frame that has a lot of surface soiling and dust accumulation. And um, you want to make sure you protect your work from dust. Um, not only does it cause staining and, uh, and things like that, but it can also attract mold uh, and pests. 
And this, you can, you can see the buildup along the edge of the frame there. And I mean, this could have been just easily prevented by having a dust cover over the back of the frame. Um, but in this case, it didn't. So always make sure you have a dust co cover. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, I, I'm not sure if you can see uh, this one that well in the slide, but um, this is an example of some water damage on a print. So water damage in paper often results in a tide line. And the tide line is at the interface where the water and the dry paper, paper meet. Um, and it creates kind of a stain there uh, based off of the soiling or uh, degradation products in the paper. You can also get mold, uh, media loss, and surface disruptions. And you can see the little uh, wavy, waviness, the, the undulations in the paper as well due to water damage. Um, in this case, this artwork was stored directly on the ground um, in a basement. Uh, so again, if you have the option, uh, don't, store your, <laughs> don't store your artwork in a basement, an attic, or a garage if you can at all avoid. And uh, also, when you store your artwork or hang it, um, just be aware of where the plumbing is in your house as well. A lot of people these days have um, laundry on a second floor or something like that. Uh, you may not want to store an important piece right underneath your laundry room, <laughs> for example. Um, so just, again, something to be aware of where are where am I placing things in my house? Um, a good, another good um, thing to do if you're concerned about water damage is to cover things in plastic if you're going to be away from a, for an extended period of time. So it's very easily, if, you, you know, if you're in a way, way on vacation for several weeks, just to cover your artwork in a sheet of po uh, polyethylene. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later in the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a great example of light damage on a print. Um, in the video on the left, um, you can see that it has the matte covering. And then clearly, when it's lifted, um, there is a significant color change uh, and stain in the paper. Um, where the mat was covering it. So this was caused by light damage. This was caused by uh, uh, probably uh, high amounts of sunlight, but also caused by uh, poor quality paper and a poor quality mat. And light damage uh, often leads to oxidization in papers that contain lignin. And this promotes yellowing and brittleness in the paper. And um, so you can see where the light <laughs> you know, was there. The, the mat covered up part of uh, the print. Um, but you can also see that in the, in the uh, mat itself, and, and this might be something interesting for you to do, go home and take a look at some of the mats in your collection. Um, you can see that the yellow edge on the bevel edge of the, the frame in the right hand corner has turned yellow. So that should be white, right? Um, if you have a high quality mat, um, that shouldn't happen. It shouldn't um, contain lignin. So it's an early sign, is if you are starting to see that yellowing of the mat, that um, perhaps you might want to get it uh, replaced before it becomes a, a larger issue. Uh, next slide. So is, is that from acid in the paper or? Yes. Um, so it, it's technically not acid itself there to begin with. It's um, a paper that is a pulp-based paper, so wood-based fibers. Wood-based fibers contain lignin. Um, I could have a, probably a whole hour, like two hour talk on artist papers and um, the different, <laughs> different types of, of papers and um, 
uh, things and sizing and papers and paper components. But in this case, um, this was a, a mat board that was likely wood based pulp containing lignin. Um, when sun and sunlight and oxidization occurs in wood based papers, a lignin breaks down um, through oxidization processes, and one of the byproducts is sulfuric acid. And that's what causes the yellowing and acidification. So that it, it is eventually acid buildup, but it's not acid itself, it's the lignin in the wood pulp. That's fascinating, yes. thank you. Oh yes, okay. Um, and I think for me as a paper conservator, um, I have a job because people use pressure sensitive tapes. <laughs> because I spend a lot of time removing old tape from, from, um, from matting and objects and things like that. Um, all, pressure sensitive, all pressure sensitive tape over time will degrade and the adhesive will um, cross-link, so the, the adhesive will yellow and brittle stain the, the object where it was placed, um, making it very difficult to remove. Um, this is also true of um, tapes that are marketed as removable or temporary, archival. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> They're all evil. Tape is evil. <laughs> so <laughs> if I could... Um, advise you at all. Um, if you don't want a conservator 50 years from now to have to go in and, and do a tape removal, um, ask your framer if, if um, hinge, like uh, different types of hinging are available. You can do um, pocket hinges and things like that where there's no adhesives uh, used on the object as, uh, at all. So like little, fo like, you know, like photo corners um, in an album or something like that. It's not always possible depending if you're float, float framing it or like that kind of thing, but um, using non-adhesive methods is always preferred if it's possible. Um, and if not, like tea hinges with wheat starch paste and Japanese tissue is always going to be reversible. Um, and you'll never have an issue with that. Of course, it is more time consuming because, uh, and a little bit more um, laborious to apply those sorts of things, but um, you'll never ever have a problem like that. One of, the thi one of the great things about wheat starch paste is that it has excellent aging properties. It doesn't yellow, and it um, stays reversible for hundreds of years. At, 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 at least we know. I mean, it's been used in Japanese scrolls for hundreds of years and has retained all of its um, um, great properties that we love of reversibility. So as far as we know, we can always be able to remove something like that with uh, no damage. Um, so if you do have to uh, store your framed art, uh, artwork um, for whatever reason, um, always think about the location where you're going to store it. I like to suggest uh, bedroom closets as a, as a great place to store your um, artwork. Generally, they're closed. They're away from light. Uh, they also usually don't have plumbing above them, so that's all, uh, or they're away from plumbing. <laughs> so that's also a benefit of uh, bedroom closets. Uh, you also uh, always try to store your uh, artwork off the ground by at least three inches. So if you do have, you know, if you do have to store it in the basement or at a place that's not ideal, you still do have some protection against. Um, you know, a, a water uh, leaking or something like that. Also pests, a lot of people don't think about that, but protection of guests, insects, mice, that sort of thing that um, might want to make home, um, <laughs> nice home there. And uh, so put them on blocks um, if you can. 
Uh, styrofoam is great just for short term, something like that. And uh, always put separator boards in between them as well to prevent uh, abrasion, um, image transfer, things like that. You want to protect the surface of your painting or the glazing itself. Uh, you can use a separator board there. Um, chloroplast is great because you can find it readily available here in Regina. Um, it's also water resistant, um, so that's great property of it. If you don't have that, you know, um, Cardboard is okay as well, if it's short-term temporary, uh, as well as uh, foam core, something like that. Just something to protect um, the, the front of the artwork there. And then, if possible, if you're worried about water um, and dust, cover it with a sheet of polyethylene uh, sheeting. Works great. Uh, I also like to give options that are uh, that don't use plastics. And uh, although it's not waterproof, uh, you can use cotton sheet, an old cotton bed sheet, an old cotton towels, things like that that have been washed with a mild detergent, uh, scent free, you know, uh, detergent or something like that. So clean cotton sheet uh, can also be a great dust cover. And it's nice to have an option that doesn't, um, that you can repurpose, reuse, and not purchase plastic items. Next slide. Um, for glass or ceramics, um, again, I'm not an objects conservator, so I'm going to gla glance over this a little bit uh, uh, more than I normally would. Uh, but a strong cardboard box, if you're storing it long term, or a food grade polystyrene box. So those are like the polystyrene um, containers that a lot of people use as like um, a cooler. You know, you can put your cold packs in it, things like that. Those work great as well. And you can pad it out with uh, tissue paper or again, a clean cotton textile. Um, great way to reuse um, old materials. And ideally, each, each item would have its own box. I know this, again, it's not always ideal or not always possible, um, but ideally, that would be the case. And in terms of metals, metals are a little bit different because there's so many different types, and I don't want to get talking too much into that. But ideally, um, long-term storage, you would wrap in an acid-free, unbuffered tissue paper. So one that doesn't include um, calcium carbonate or other item or other agents used to um, create uh, an acid-free environment for longer term, um, and then place those into a polyethylene zipper bag or a food-grade polystyrene box so it's air airtight, and um, and that's a great long-term storage solution for for metals. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so I said I'd just talk briefly about some of the conservation materials that we have at hand here in Regina. I know we're a little bit isolated sometimes in Saskatchewan from conservation supply stores. But again, it doesn't have to be um, that high tech. Um, you can get conservation materials at the Home Depot. This is a picture I took a couple weeks ago there. Um, what you want to look for in a, a plastic sheeting is number four. Uh, on the little recycle symbol. That uh, symbolizes low density polyethylene, which is a great stable plastic. And we use that for a lot for uh, plastic sheeting. So just look for the clear sheets though. Sometimes it comes in different colors. Um, sometimes it's white uh, color. Usually white or clear are your best options when um, purchasing uh, plastic sheeting. Next slide. And uh, I, talk, I talked about the chloroplast or corrugated plastic. This is another one you can pick up at the Home Depot. Um, and it's just a plastic uh, polypropylene. So look for the recycle symbol number five. Again, it usually comes in multiple colors. Uh, sometimes it's used for so like s outdoor signs and um, things like that. But look for the white or clear. And you should be, it's a great, great project um, that's easily readily available. 
that's all I've got for today, but I'm sure there's many questions. <laughs> that, and that was just like the tip of an iceberg, so. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Robin. Yeah, thank that you. was really great. So yeah, we do want to um, take some time to open it up in case we do have any questions from the audience. I'll just say, you know, these experts are not expert in everything. They don't want to give you very specific. But if you have some general questions, um, the one thing we didn't talk about was smoke. I think uh, smoke is the other thing that I see on a lot of artworks. Um, so it's something I think most of us are now in smoke-free homes. So maybe it's a problem we're going to see less of in the future when it comes to artwork. But um, a lot of the pieces that we get offered to us for donation at the, at the collection is, has that, that is an issue. So yeah, smoke. Yeah, um, if you remember back, there was a slide and it had two pictures of me side by side. One of them, I was working on a nicotine uh, removal of a watercolor. And it was a watercolor on paper and uh, it was never glazed, so there was never any um, barrier in between the paper and um, you know the open room with uh, where a lot of smoking happened and um, boy that was really a difficult treatment I, not only did I spend two semesters working on it in school but another student spent two semesters working on it um, so that's like a limited time and effort that went in on on that one treatment but um, again, like a lot of uh, that damage was irreversible as well because it was a watercolor, and um, that limits the you know the solvents and uh, the treatments that we're able to do on it. So it does have a lot of discoloration. We were able to reduce it, but not uh, to its full um, you know what it would have been like without the the nicotine. And, yeah. So yeah. another preventative, um, something you can prevent with, definitely. with your own collections. Yeah, if you have paper-based artwork, definitely m ensure there's glazing for sure. Yeah. So do we have any questions from the audience at all? Oh, oh let's start with Gail. Okay, so we've had a question about if you have a piece that is a work on paper that has been glazed um, and has been in a smoking home, um, could it still be considered for donation? So I'm going to answer that one because I work with Provincial Art Collection. So I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. Depends on what the artwork is. Um, we do ask that question. Um, when somebody comes to us with art objects for consideration. Any, with the Sask Arts Board, um, uh, Sask Arts, Saskatchewan Arts Board collection, anybody can put a work forward for consideration. So it will be considered, but we'll ask that question. And then those are some of the things that we take into account when we're deciding, um, are we going to accept it or not? Like. Do we need to invest some money in a new frame? Does it require some conservation or is it because our, our, we're really wanting the work to go out into the public and be seen if possible? So if it needs conservation, then that restricts that and we only have so much budget. Um, so it just depends on what the artwork is. If it's a rare thing that we think is worth um, bringing into the collection, even though we might need to invest some some um, money into that conservation, the biggest problem for us is there isn't a lot of conservation conservators working in the province. So it usually in involves additional cost of the preparator making um, crating um, materials, tra you know, packing materials sending it to Vancouver or to Manitoba or to Alberta and then getting it shipped back afterwards. 
I can tell you that we've had some examples where um, families have come to us with an important piece, and as part of the donation, they're, they're um, going to contribute to some of those costs of conservation or transportation. So that can kind of sweeten the deal for us a little bit sometimes because those costs are real. Um, there, there can be a barrier for us for accepting work. So, um, you know, we do cover the cost of appraisal um, with donation. Um, if it gets accepted by, and there's a committee that will make that decision. It's not like one person. So, yeah, donation is something to think about, estate planning. Um, or even if you're a big collector, um, you might want to think about consignment. You know, do you want to take some works, rehome them, put them back on the market? You can come to any of the, the galleries that are at the our fair today. Most of them will do consignment, and they can sell the work on your behalf, and that frees up some money to either buy new pieces for your collection or put some money into, you know, some of the care of your collection and um, those costs. So, yeah, there's, that's a good question, Gail. Um, Anne, you had a question as well? Yes, um, I could have questions for everyone, but uh, I'll zoom on the, the insurance aspect. Um, I was wondering if you would have any recommendation to facilitate the conversation about I have artworks, some are a collection, some are the ones that I create, and somehow I find that it's very tricky. As soon as I start to give information about the, the topic, I feel like the broker is sweating on the other side of the, the call, and uh, it's, it becomes very complicated to try to figure out if indeed that's really looking for a specialty uh, approach in the end. So, Dennis, before you answer, I'm just going to repeat the question so that it'll be people listening later in the recording. So Anne's asking, as someone who has a collection of other people's art, but is also an artist herself and makes art at home and stores work at home, is your studio at home or you have a studio? Yeah, studio at home, which is the same as me. Um, what are things that we should be, how do we broach those conversations with their insurer broker? Having been a broker on the other side of those calls, yeah, you, you do sweat a little bit for sure. That's that's part of the conversation. Um, my advice would be the more information that you can provide your broker, the better. Um, as far as you know, what kind of pieces you're creating, storing, um, whatever processes you're using, chemicals that you might be using or, or using as part of the process, um, anything that you can provide to your broker that they can turn around and provide to the insurance company. Uh, because in the end, it's, it's the, the underwriter, the insurance company that makes the final decision as to whether they're gonna provide coverage, how they're gonna provide coverage. Um, so yeah, anything that you can provide as far as you know, what you're doing, how you're doing it, um, is certainly, more information is always better. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably an issue that, that it's not something that brokers deal with on, on a regular basis. Um, well, I, I think if you're looking for coverage for specific items, having that appraisal for sure is the way to go. Um, most insurance companies are not going to provide coverage without an appraisal anyway. And typically that appraisal has to be updated every three to five years so that you are constantly kind of keeping up with what the value of that that object is um, the, the the insurance companies they will have kind of a list of you know appraisers that they you know they will take the appraisals from um, in a lot of cases as long as they're you know an accredited a Canadian appraiser that, that, that typically isn't an issue um, but but anything that you can you can do to kind of pr provide the value or prove the value, it is going to help with that as well. I think I think the 
big one for that. Um, again, is documentation, knowing what you have. But every insurance company is different, so you have to always ask the question. But like Dennis said, that big question is, what's the magic number where I have to buy additional insurance? So the things will fall under contents, but there comes that magic number of where you need more. And so I think, like, I myself didn't know when I, you know, started collecting that that was even a thing. Um, and when I, I had spoken to my insurance company, they just, uh, you know, oh, art kind of falls under its own thing. They, same thing. They, I didn't ask the right questions. So um, whenever I have a client uh, wanting an appraisal for insurance purposes, I always say, I'm not an insurance broker, but I would recommend calling your insurance um, provider and asking them two questions. Um, one, what's the magic number? And two, what, what does my um, policy cover? Is it replacement value? The majority, that is it. But it could be something else. It could be fair market value. Um, so asking them, what's the magic number? What does my policy cover? And then um, I think another good one to also ask is the, the cap. Like if I have multiple pieces that are all at the $25 range, you know, nice vases and mugs and all those handcrafted objects, if I hit $5,000 or whatever it is, is nothing else covered? So those are really important questions to ask. Great, thanks. Gail? Okay, so Gail is asking about, she has receipts for some pieces in her collection, in her collection, but some were things that were gifts, and others, because she taught for many years, were gifts from students or trades, artists often trade with each other. So um, my advice would be to make a record of how you acquired the work. I think that's really important so that if you do decide to do an appraisal, um, the appraiser will have that information. And you can um, sort of know, depending if that student be went on to become a great artist and had a long career, generally the artist, the value of our work um, is definitely influenced by if that artist continues to make work, exhibit work, and sell work. Um, that can lead to value going up. Am I correct in that? You're my expert, but... Well, um, just because someone gave a gift or because you did something in trade doesn't mean it doesn't have a value. Um, and that's actually really important information because an appraisal is not an authentication, but it does help to show that it is authentic. If you say, you know, I, I received this work directly from the artist as a trade, it's then part of showing that it, it's a, a real piece. So that's really important. And the starting value, whether it's an original receipt, a gift and all that, is just a very small piece of the puzzle. Where the appraisal will happen is it's again doing the research and looking for evidence. So the appraiser is looking for comparables that at the time of the, the effective date, at that time, what are those pieces going for? So just because you got it as a gift or a trade doesn't lower the value. Um, it's just a really good piece of knowledge to have. And from an from an insurance perspective, I would be looking at getting them appraised. Um, you're more likely to get get the coverage that you need if it's appraised rather than going by receipts or, or fair market value because that can change so drastically year to year. Okay. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. So Julia, do you have a question? Okay. 
Okay, so I'm going to repeat for sound. Julia Deep Pockets Kruger has just <laughs> purchased a $15,000 watercolor unframed. So she'd like each of our experts to give her some advice on what she should do now that she's put a sizable investment into that purchase. So, Yolan? The first thing I would do is document it. So I would record all the information that um, I know about it. Uh, I, if the gallery is able to provide me with an uh, artist bio, uh, I would keep my original receipt, I would take a photo of it. Um, so I would have all that information put aside for if down the road I need to have an appraisal done. You don't need to get, uh, this is purchasing from a gallery right off the bat. Um, th that is your information that you have right there and then. So it would be documenting it so that you have it. I would probably follow along with that, but once you have all that documentation, get into your broker's office and make sure you get it added to your policy right away. Just because as long as they've got a record of it, then then you, can ha then you have the coverage in place for it right away. Don't roll it. <laughs> um, hopefully, hopefully it's come in its own enclosure uh, so that nothing happens in, uh, to it on your way home. Um, if you're not able to take it to a framer right away as well, hopefully it has an appropriate um, enclosure, uh, just to keep it protected and things like that in your vehicle. But you will, um, if you're not going to get it completely framed, you know, even just making sure it's matted and has a, a backing board, so it has a support, it has a protective enclosure, um, just something simple as that can really go a long way. So it doesn't have to include the full frame, the glazing and everything right away. Um, that's something you probably want to look at um, doing in the future. Um, but again, just that it has something there. Just don't roll it and don't put tape on it. <laughs> that was a great question. Yeah, Thanks, that was a Julia. really great question. So I'd like to thank our panelists again. And it was so informative. I think I'm going to recommend the recording of this to all artists and collectors, especially the information about the appraisal was so great and the conservation and insurance, all really important things to know when you're, you know, taking care of your objects for both their financial um, ramifications, but also the sentimental, you know, ramifications of taking really good care of these objects that, so that they can live on. You know, um, we're just our caretakers for these things over time. So thanks, everybody.